Hello there. Welcome to another episode of I Love This, You Should Too, a podcast with him, Indy Randawa, and me, Samantha Randawa. How are you, Indy? Oh, I'm full of vengeance. Cool. How well, about you? I'm not full of vengeance. Oh, then you are free. Yeah. Because vengeance is its own prison, after all. True. Very true. We did learn that this week. <laughs> Uh, If you're new to the podcast, uh, every other week we take turns picking a movie and then we talk about it the next week. And this week we are talking about the 2003 film Old Boy. And this was my pick, something that I had seen. I think I saw it in theaters in around 2003-4. It was playing at Metro here, Mm -hmm. probably, and I had heard about this movie. They're like, oh, you have to see it. It's wild. (laughs) And I went and saw it, and it was pretty wild. It's pretty wild. And I think this is my first revisit since then. Oh. Because when I lived in Korea, I actually saw very few Korean movies because uh, they're not subtitled there, and my Korean is not good enough to watch a whole movie without right. subtitles. They do talk, like it seems like they talk fast. But this was my pick, something that I said I loved, and I think I still do. Oh. Upon our rewatch, right at the beginning, I was like, oh, I don't know if this is good. And then we watched it and I thought about it and we rewatched a little right now to Mm -hmm. prepare for the podcast. And looking back on it now, I'm like, oh, yeah, it is. It is very good. This is a very (laughs) good movie. But the last time I picked a Park Chan-wook movie was I'm a Cyborg and That's Okay. But That's Okay. Either way. And That's Okay. One of those two. And it was one of your least favorite movies that I had picked for you. So now we're back. Yeah. And this has a lot of elements that I think you will dislike, (laughs) but here we are. So, Samantha, upon a rewatch, I still love this movie. Do you? No. I didn't think you would. (laughs) I liked it more than I'm a Cyborg. Mm -hmm. I think I'd give it like a six and a half out of ten. Okay. I enjoyed parts of it. Uh I can like appreciate some of it as like a film that's trying something or doing something i don't think i can love this movie though do you think you're able to pinpoint what things in this movie made you not love it was it some of the the violence some of the content i think it was some of the violence Uh it like took quite a bit for me to like understand the movie like it took me reading a synopsis after to really like kind of cement Okay. What I just watched. And I do think this movie is better upon rewatching. Yeah. Because I saw it for the first time so long ago. And then when we rewatched it just uh, two days ago, mm-hmm. it was better. But I had actually forgotten a lot of the reasoning behind it. I remembered mm-hmm. the big twist. And uh, in case you were wondering, this is going to be a spoiler filled yes. episode. And a movie like this, uh, you should see before it gets spoiled because it's uh, it's quite an ending yeah but watching it now having having just rewatched it two days ago it seemed much better so i think it is something that gets better upon rewatches mm-hmm. but maybe let's start off with going over some of those things sure. maybe if you have some questions about clarity perhaps i'll be able to answer and clarify that Then we can talk about uh, some of the influences on this movie, because this was my response to your pick of John Wick. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about some of those similarities. And then I want to talk about some of those big themes like alienation, like punishment and revenge, one's sense of self and all of that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff. Maybe we'll get into some of those visual motifs, because I think there were some cool ones like teeth and hammers and all of that kind of stuff. (laughs) And uh, the violence. We'll talk a bit about that. That because this movie actually not that violent. Uh-huh. It's I think very it's implied. The, the way it was done. Yes, and I think I am going to use the words uh, visceral, uh-huh. raw, and brutal a lot in talking about this movie. And I yeah. think that might be what you didn't like about it. I think so. And then maybe we'll finish off about the ending. Mm-hmm. What's that all about? Yeah, I I don't know. So first off, were there some things? either plot-wise or maybe culturally that you didn't quite get about the movie. Yeah, so one thing 
that like right off the bat, I didn't understand what this prison was. Well, I think it's nothing more than a kind of like in John Wick where we understand that there is this whole other world that we are not familiar with. They have this secret hotel and everything. Mm -hmm. In this version of Korea, somebody has a essentially a private prison that they're running out of some big building. And they are just taking money to keep someone captive there for up to 15 years. Apparently. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. I understand it like contextually in the movie. I just didn't really understand what it was, I guess. Like, How do you mean? Like, like physically? Physically what it was. I mean, I get it now. But like that was one thing that I just like didn't really understand when we were watching it. And I kind of had to just like move on from it. I think movies like this that seem very realistic in many ways, mm-hmm. because once he gets into the outside world, it seems like our version of the world. Yeah. Things like that are easy to get hung up on. Mm-hmm. While if this was a more fantastic movie, you'd be like, oh, yeah, there's a big prison in that. Yeah. And it's no big Which prison. is kind of what I ended up having to do. Yeah. And then like kind of research it later. I was just like, okay, I just need to like let that portion go. And there's a lot of things in this movie that you have to do that with. You're mm-hmm. like, oh, hypnosis works fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, there's gases that can do all of these things. All right, that's just how this world works. And you just move on while I think because it is a realist movie in a lot of ways, it's harder to reconcile those things. Mm-hmm. While if it's Star Wars, you're like, oh, um, you can use magic to move things and there's a laser sword. Cool, no problem. <laughs> But we don't accept those as readily when there is such a true-to-life emotional core, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's something that I just kind of had to reconcile in my mind. Yeah, it's just just kind of... like, I just need to move on. That's how it is here. Okay. And enjoy, like, the rest of the movie, because... Like with John Wick, there's that whole hotel that Mm -hmm. caters to hitmen. That doesn't make any sense, no. but that's their world, so cool. Yeah, exactly. So I just kind of had to do that and not like... Dwell? Dwell. Yeah, I just kind of had to move on as we moved away from the prison. Um, the other thing I didn't really understand was that it was like hypnosis. Right. Like I kind of thought... It, it didn't click in my mind that it was hypnosis. Like I know what hypnosis is and I know that it's like a hotly contested subject of like whether or not it works but I kind of it didn't click for me that it was hypnosis I kind of just thought that they were just like feeding him information I thought that as well and I kind of forgotten about the whole hypnosis part so Mm -hmm. when there's the reveal of that lady and the towards the end of the movie where Lee is kind of explaining what he has done up to this point you're just like oh he hypnotized them yeah I I don't know if I love that element, but I guess it's just a thing in this world and it's convenient to kind of just like, okay, now let's move on. Yeah, it kind of seemed like something that didn't need to be there. Yeah, I think you could have done it without hypnosis. And I think the uh, American remake removes the hypnosis part. Oh, okay. And it is more just suggestion, but that's just a worse movie all around. Got it. I haven't seen it. I did read the synopsis for it just to kind of see what, like, if there were differences. Mm -hmm. And there were. Um, one thing I didn't realize was that the chef in the sushi restaurant was Mido. Oh. And I think it's because she's like all made up. She's wearing a wig. And she's wearing a wig. She's like got makeup on and stuff and she's wearing that outfit. And then we don't see her in that outfit again. But she goes to him when he passes out and then he wakes up in Mido's apartment and you thought this was just some random person's apartment yeah for a little bit okay that could be confusing that was confusing to me because she looks totally different oh. and we don't ever see her again in that outfit so i, oh, I guess thought... i just recognized her face and was like yeah that's her no it, because it... they had that kind of moment at the the restaurant yeah. so i assume there was something between them upon rewatching, knowing that it's the same person right. it makes more sense and you can see lee in the background of that scene too yeah. if you look close enough Yeah, so that was like something that kind of caught me off guard when I finally realized that it was, and that was like midway through the movie that I was like, oh, they're the same person. Right. (laughs) This isn't just like another person in the Yeah, there's kind of only uh, five people in this movie. (laughs) Which is why I thought it was odd that there was like two female characters that were different. And that we never see one of them again. So it was all one person. Um, But yeah, so that kind of caught me off guard. And then I also missed that Mito was his daughter. 
But I think that could have been like subtitles. Wait, like at the end of the big reveal, you didn't get that he had been sleeping with his daughter? Yeah. Oh, that's a big thing to yeah. have missed. So, oh, and I wow. think it's because I was trying to, like I've said before on the podcast, like I struggle is either reading subtitles or watching the movie for me. Right. So I was really trying hard to like do both so that I didn't miss some things in the like scenery and like that kind of thing. So I think I may have been looking at what was happening on screen instead of reading the subtitles. And I missed but that. It was in both because there is the book. Remember, he's going through the yeah. book and you get to see her age until they meet. I just didn't really get that. So on your first watching at the end, you were just like, I don't know what just happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was that a must little lost. Been... That's why I immediately like went and read the synopsis because I was like, gotcha. oh, and then I read the synopsis and I was like, oh, that makes this so much weirder. <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> so, yeah, that was. But at the end, we were we don't talk much. Yeah. But I said like, oh, man, he banged his daughter. Yeah. And you were just like, well, that's an odd thing for you to say, indeed. I think I was starting to put it together at that point. Gotcha. Because we'd like seen the whole movie and I was like thinking about it. And yeah, it was just, it was like something I kind of missed. But I think it's kind of obvious when you go back and watch it again, which yes. we always kind of do watch some of it. Um, but yeah, that was something that I was like kind of confused about at the end. Anything else? No, I just like appreciated some of the things that are kind of Korean, like um the water inside. I think that's kind of neat. What do you? Oh, in um in Lee's the, yeah, uh, in like the house. final scene in the big penthouse. Yeah, yeah. like that's that's kind of cool. I don't know if that's a, a Korean thing. Well, I guess maybe none of my friends in Korea were rich enough to have that. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's just a rich <laughs> feels person like a rich thing. person thing. Yeah, and yeah. also that like sweet closet thing he had yeah. in his shower and there everything. There was like some very cool things. That's that just I was, such a cool place. Like he had. architecture. Yeah. Um, and then the grass on the rooftops. Oh, yeah. Like when he's opened in that suitcase and mm -hmm. he breaks out of the suitcase, he's like on a rooftop that has grass. And I think that's so cool. And I like know there's at least one building in Edmonton that has grass on the rooftop. But um, I think that's just such a cool thing. You know what? I don't know if I've ever been on a building with uh, grass on the rooftop when I lived in Korea. Oh. So maybe it's not very common there. I have in Norway, though. They love it over there. Ah, uh, yeah. Those sod roofs. I know like big metropolitan cities that don't have like parks and stuff in like downtown tend to have that kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. but I think it's just such a neat idea. Yeah, we should have more of that. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the things that I didn't understand or also thought were cool. <laughs> so do you see why I would have picked this in response to John Wick? Yeah, I definitely see similarities. Like I said last episode, like the front of the DVD just like looks like John Wick. Yeah. <laughs> so this, of like... course, uh, came out nine, eleven years earlier, and uh, I guess there's the 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 stylized violence, some of the choreography, and the mm -hmm. overall tone. I feel is pretty similar. And then just that idea of this relentless pursuit of revenge and revenge being all encompassing, uh -huh. and the idea of one's identity being tied up in this revenge. So yeah. that's what made me think of Old Boy after your pick of John Wick. And also there's this kind of underworld that is yeah. uh, secret and kind of interesting too. Mm -hmm. But I think here everything seems much less polished, mm -hmm. I guess. And when we first put it on, I was like, oh, this movie doesn't look as good as I remember. Uh -huh. And I think that's because now we have so many... Movies that say like, oh, yeah, this is the gritty underworld, but it's super sleek and shiny looking. Yeah, like John Wick, it's very shiny and tidy and yes. like this is how things are. And this one is actually gritty. It's gritty. And also yeah. this has a much lower budget. This was a three million dollar budget. Oh, so wow. for movies that we talk about, usually that is very low. Mm hmm. Maybe let's talk a little bit about some influences on Old Boy now that we've mentioned a movie that. Old Boy has influenced. Mm -hmm. So first, uh, Korean cinema of the time, there was kind of this movement from like the late 90s into the early 2000s that people often call the Korean New Wave. And there was a lot of exploration of social and psychological alienation. 
Park Chan-wook specifically had done these three movies that he calls the Vengeance Trilogy, which is um, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, Old Boy, and Lady Vengeance. And they're not a trilogy in the strictest sense, just that they are all about the idea of revenge. They've got revenge. Like, themes yes. running through them. And there's a lot of film noir in this as well. We talked a lot about film noir when we did, what was our big film noir movie we did? Uh, Double Indemnity? Yeah. So you can go back and listen to that. <laughs> but how it comes out in this one, it's thematically a lot with those ideas of vengeance again. Mm -hmm. But also that there are these morally ambiguous characters where you're not sure if Desu in this, is he a good guy? Is he a terrible guy? Yeah. I don't really know. And at the end, you're not really sure either. Mm -hmm. And then those uh, stylized aesthetics, everything is kind of dark and shadowy. Uh, the use of narration as well. Mm -hmm. I like the narration in this a lot. Sometimes it can be too much and it's just explaining away the plot. Yeah. But this one, it just kind of gave you insight into this guy who is still kind of like an unreliable narrator because mm -hmm. you're not sure. First, you're not even sure if he's still sane at this point. Right? Yeah. Yeah, they do give you a couple little moments where you really question, is he just insane now? Yeah. Like, is this, is any of this credible? And then, uh, like, how is he going to fare in the world if he is just, like, totally mentally gone? And this was adapted from a Japanese manga. So there's a lot of influence from that, too. It's not something I've read, so I can't really speak mm. to it. But there are shots in this that definitely seem comic booky. Like when he I lifts up that, that hammer and there's like, you think it's a freeze frame, but the yeah. characters are slightly moving still. So it's just everyone is frozen. There was a couple moments like that where I was like, I could see this being just like a book. Yeah. And then I think there's a lot of Hitchcock in this as well. Uh, we haven't done much Hitchcock, but we'll have to do some more. Specifically, my favorite one of his, Vertigo, mm -hmm. because this seems to have a lot of those similar themes, the way it builds tension, the way it plays with audiences' expectations. But while in Vertigo, it is all about the psyche of mm -hmm. one character, here it has extended into the physical and all of these kind of primal and brutal elements that this movie brings in. But I think maybe the biggest is it's Greek. It's Greek tragedy. Mm -hmm. This is a like epic Greek tragedy at its heart, it seems like. Um, it seems most like Oedipus. Mm -hmm. And Oedipus and Odesu, they even look the same a little bit, the names. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you're not familiar, uh, spoiler alert for Oedipus, <laughs> I guess. Can we Oedipus spoil Rex. a Greek tragedy? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to. So in uh, this, of course, Desu seeks out the truth, despite the advice from his girlfriend, who he discovers is his daughter. In Oedipus, he seeks out the truth, despite the advice from his wife, who he discovers is his mother. Mm. When he learns the truth, Desu cuts out his tongue. And when Oedipus learns the truth, he pokes out, of his, pokes out his eyes. So there's a lot of that, just uh, kind of the fates conspiring against mm. one individual. It seems very very Greek and all of those themes of guilt and redemption and the cyclical nature of revenge, I think comes from all of those Greek tragedies. And there's a lot of Shakespeare like this. There's a lot of Titus Andronicus in this. Have you ever read or seen a version of that? No, I haven't. That's one I'm not familiar with. It's one of his earlier plays and it is the most brutal and violent and people are being made into pies and fed to their mothers. And Oh, see, I, I feel like I know some of the little like tidbits from that, yeah. but I've never like overall. hands and tongues are cut out in mm -hmm. that one as well. So there's a lot of uh, Titus Andronicus. And I think everything kind of gets described as Kafka-esque as soon as something gets confusing. But I think there, this definitely fits with things like uh, the trial, somebody being lost in this world and having no answers mm -hmm. and the, uh, the frustration and the isolation that that brings. But rather than getting more intellectual or pretentious in this movie, it just goes for the, for the raw and the visceral. And there is a lot of that. <laughs> well, let's talk about that because you said the violence was one of the, the harder parts for yeah. you. Which ones or how in general? Um, I think 
having just watched John Wick, like that is a very violent movie. But I think... But it's a clean violence. Yeah, right? I was going to say, like, like pop, it's shot. quick. They don't really linger or like build tension in it. It's just like he's going around, he's doing his job, and he's so efficient that there almost isn't any emotion to it from the viewer. Whereas in this movie, like you said... um, that it looks kind of comic booky when he's like raising the hammer and he really like they take their time with all of these like violent moments. And I think that was really hard to kind of sit through because you're almost feeling it like viscerally because you're seeing these moments and you're really seeing the pain on people's faces and it's more torture like that people die and people get really hurt but it's more of the torture side of um like violence and i think that is uh very intentional and i think it is distinct from movies like a I, I know I'm dating myself, but <laughs> ones like the the later Saw movies mm-hmm. and your hostels and things like that, which we were often called torture porn. Yeah. Because this, if you actually look at freeze frames from the movie, mm-hmm. there is very little, not very little, for a movie that seems so violent. There yeah. is very little actual violence being shown a lot True. of the time. Yeah. Like the tooth one, he puts the hammer up. And that effect actually was very good. And I noticed when, as soon as I mentioned that, you were touching your teeth because it has that visceral effect yeah. on you, right? I had to look away. Like, so, I don't actually know what they showed because I So they away. put the hammer up to his tooth, and I don't know how they do this effect, but there's like a little drop of blood that seems to come from his gum line. Mm-hmm. And it's wonderfully done. And then the next shot is teeth falling. Right. You don't get to see anything get pulled out. And when they're doing the same thing to Desu the first time, it's a fake out, right? Because right. he says, like, the anticipation is worse. Yeah. Which, which you are Which is exactly saying, what they're doing in the movie. Which they're doing to yeah. us. Yeah, that's a nice yeah. little commentary on that. But they don't actually do it. Of course, there is violence yeah. in this movie. But you reacting viscerally to it. I think is exactly what they're going for because this movie is all about how you get lost in those ideas Mm -hmm. of revenge and it takes over who you are and you feel it and it's all you feel. And that's happening to us as viewers. Right. And I think movies like this can even get like pigeonholed into the category of like ultra violence and they're exploitative almost in that, that they're just showing you all of this violence and Oftentimes that masks bad storytelling. It's a spectacle or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's what they're doing here. First, because they rarely show things, but it feels like the violence in this movie is relevant. It feels like every violent moment here is saying something that is a part of the story as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I love that uh, the big fight scene that this movie is known for, that kind of side-scrolling scene where he has the hammer. Mm -hmm. And here, it's very different from John Wick because it's not efficient in any sort of way. It's very different from the fighting in a Marvel movie because it's not spectacular in Mm -hmm. any way. And it's different from, like, a Bruce Lee movie because there's no (sighs) beauty in this violence. No, it's just very raw. That's the, the exact word I have written down Oh my here. goodness. <laughs> it's raw. It's violent. Yeah. It's clumsy at times. He gets tired during it. He has a rest during this fight scene. Mm. And the people that he's fighting, I love how they react. Because in big fight scenes, you're like, why does every bad guy approach one at a time? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but here, it seems like that's kind of addressed because first they're in a narrow hallway. Yeah, you and can't second, all go at once. they all start going all at once. But after seeing their friends get smashed with a hammer, everyone is very tentative. And yeah. there's those parts where they are staying far away and just kind of throwing their sticks, kind yeah. of like, t- like, hey, get out of here, but not really going for yeah. it because they're scared of getting smashed in the face with a hammer, Ooh. which is a legitimate fear. Yeah. And he just has this kind of a dogged determination. It's not mm. that he is the best fighter, although I guess he is the best fighter as well. Yeah. But it's that doesn't seem to be his superpower. His superpower is that he is fueled with vengeance and to seek out the truth that he's willing to do anything. It's the determination rather than his fighting ability. 
and dogged, I think, is a good term for it because he's he's animalistic, and that mm-hmm. kind of comes through the movie a lot too. That the comparison of him to to a beast, to an animal, as violent as it was, did you find anything in this movie funny? I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to like think back. Um, yeah, I don't know that I can like pinpoint anything that I found funny. But would you say the tone of this movie is? lighter at times than mm. something should be with this amount of violent and with violence and with this content. Yeah, I'd say there are some like lighter moments for sure. Like the suppositories. Oh right. It's yeah. like a funny joke in the middle of like a really serious movie. Or close to the beginning, I love the bit where he finds that guy who's going to kill himself Mm -hmm. and he stops him and tells him his life story. And then the guy's like, whoa, what a story. Now let me tell you about my life. And Desu just walks away. away, And then we see him downstairs and he's presumably stolen those sunglasses from that lady in the elevator, I guess. So he's wearing these ridiculous sunglasses. Women's sunglasses. And we see that man fall and land on a car. Yeah. And you're like, that's a man killing himself yeah. because he couldn't find any connection to a human. And it's played for laughs. Yeah. And that's like a tricky thing. And that is a tone that is very hard to achieve. But I think this movie does. Where those there's those little bits of levity. And then if you do laugh, you question like, oh, should I be laughing at that? <laughs> there is also a moment in the prison um where the music starts and the gas starts to come out and he's like in a funny pose oh i don't recall that but like right at the beginning when he's kind of describing to the viewer that the gas comes out when the music plays he's like in a funny pose and that's like and then he falls over and is on the ground and i thought that was kind of a funny thing to like include but it was like kind of enjoyable to watch because it kind of brought the levity up again during a scene where you're like oh my god this man is being drugged and imprisoned and that stuff in his kind of a hotel prison there it's all very interesting as well because it it's where we start that idea of uh, isolation and alienation that is central to the rest of the movie i think we'll go on to talk about how his isolation remains after he leaves because Mm -hmm. we talk about how he's in a a bigger prison now but as it is seen through this part he has those ideas of um of the ants crawling out of Mm -hmm. him right so there that can just be like he's going crazy yeah because he is has been isolated and hasn't seen a person for so long Mm -hmm. and when he gets out He's like, I'm a a human and he's smelling that man or when he's in the elevator with that woman and he's just kind of latching onto the walls because he has gone mad from lack of of contact. Right. And I think ant is a fun insect to use because ants are known as like social. They live in colonies. They're always a group. They're not individual animals. And that's kind of like his aspiration to be part of a community Community again. again. Yeah. And then when he talks to Mido, she also dreams about ants. And her dream is about a man-sized ant on the subway that is sitting by itself Mm -hmm. and is isolated. So for her, her dream ant has has nobody. And (laughs) she has nobody. And Desu has nobody. So they're kind of linked in their isolation. At this point, we just think they are linked because they are both lonely people. Him because he's been (laughs) imprisoned and her for reasons we have yet to discover. But then we learn that it's been carefully orchestrated that they're they're both so lonely. Mm -hmm. And of course, we get that phrase that comes up a lot of times. There's a bunch of phrases that that reappear a lot. But one of uh, laugh and the whole world laughs with you, Mm -hmm. cry and you weep alone. And I think that'll come up again when we talk about the ending. I guess we just had to talk about revenge. Yeah. Right? I guess we, yeah. (laughs) Revenge and justice and truth. I think it's all rolled up all together a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. What do you think of him being punished in this way for the crime that he committed? I think this is a gross overreaction. Um, I guess we should establish first what was his crime? that he didn't 
say anything to his classmates? He didn't stand up for the bad guy? Well, I think all he did was because it was his last day at that school. Yeah. He just said like, oh, I saw, I forget what the sister's name was. I saw her getting it on in that room. Yeah. The end. Yeah. That's all he did. Mm -hmm. So they get into all this like, oh, you were spreading rumors, but it, it, it was true. Yeah. He sure, he should. See. And he didn't go around telling everyone. He told one person. Yeah. So you could argue that his friend who has the internet cafe has done more damage it because he's the one the that one. spread yeah. it around. And he was the one that like, oh, she's a slut. But Desu didn't even say that. No. He just said like, oh, I saw her. And he didn't know that the boy was her brother. Right. He didn't even mention that. No. But I guess it affected her so much that... Perhaps she had a hysterical pregnancy? Yeah, that's what I got from it. I'm not sure if that part was real or not, or just in Lee's storytelling, because mm -hmm. who knows? He's he's clearly pretty crazy himself, yeah. so we don't yeah. really know what's true with him. But that seems to be the case, and that she killed herself because she believed she was pregnant with her brother's child. Right. That's what I got to. <laughs> but all Desu did was... Before he left to his new school, he told his friend that he saw her with someone. Yeah. And for that, he was imprisoned for 15 years and tricked into sleeping with his daughter. Yeah. A little bit of an overreaction. A little bit. So then I guess that goes into his prison, Lee's prison. He's been a prisoner to this vengeance just as much as Desu has been. Yeah. His entire life has been about getting what he thinks is revenge for this yeah but revenge not justice yeah because is there justice in this i don't think so no i don't think that's a thing that you can get when your sister's already dead yeah and it's there's no way to undo it no really the only justice would be desu apologizing saying oh i'm very sorry yeah the just end. like clearing the air which he does at the end yeah and that's when lee is kind of free from his prison yeah i guess maybe that's why lee kills himself at that point mm -hmm. this is at the end when daesu has cut out his tongue yes. and i think that was in addition to being Ugh. so gross and they don't show it no either. they don't they do a good job of making it super gross without actually showing anything i think part of that is his acting right yeah. like you can hear all of these sounds he's making and like struggling on what i assume is a lot of blood would be in your mouth after you cut something that big out and then also just him like trying to breathe as well yeah. and like your tongue is a huge part of how your head works so i feel like that was a really good little piece of acting that he did because you would totally not know how to use any of your head appendages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, Choi Min Sik, who is uh, a well known Korean actor and has done a lot of good movies. He was in a one called I Saw the Devil, which kind of takes a lot from Old Boy, I think. Was not uh, plot wise, but I think was very inspired. It comes out a few years later. And I think he did do one American movie that I saw. I'm not sure if there were more than that, but he is very well known in Korea. And I believe he won the equivalent of a Best Actor Oscar in Korea for this movie. Oh. And I think his his portrayal was, was fantastic. He's mm. very good in this. Yeah. He's almost unrecognizable from that first scene where we have him as a drunk in the police station. Yeah. And then you see this guy later on and those are different people yeah it's a... you can see the 15 years of wear on him yes yeah i um was reading the wikipedia page which you know such a good source um and they said that he was gaining and losing weight just for like based on the shooting schedule oh wow which would probably wear on a person as well yeah. and um just like you're really is that method acting then depending yeah uh, d uh, depending on what else he did. I don't True. really know yeah. his whole process. But. I just found it crazy that you would do that based on shooting schedule. Because usually shooting schedule would be based on g what weight needed to be gained and lost. Yeah, you'd think you'd shoot it almost chronologically. Yeah, so that he could yeah. look appropriate based on whatever's happening. But yeah, that's uh, some dedication. 
I think we kind of lost what we were talking about. I but think so. I, the idea that Lee was a prisoner to his revenge yeah. and probably is only free from it when Desu cuts out his tongue and apologizes. Yeah. And I think that's what he was looking for in the end. Yeah. And yeah. that's why after that he goes and kills himself. I think him killing himself too kind of it struck me as like him being like, I'm going to be free from this, but you will never be. Yes. Like I, I will have the ability to move on and like be at peace, but I still don't think that you deserve to. Yeah. And Desu never gets his true revenge because he doesn't get to kill Lee. Lee mm-hmm. kills himself. Yeah. And then that idea, of course, of Odesu being freed from his physical prison only to be in a bigger prison is mm-hmm. explicitly said. And they Lee says that to him a few times, like, how are you enjoying your bigger prison? Right. Because when they first meet and you'd think that Desu would take his revenge by killing him, he finds out that, like, well, don't you want to know why mm-hmm. you were imprisoned and why you were let go? Mm-hmm. And then he's a prisoner to this idea of the truth and goes throughout and is possibly more tortured after being released Mm -hmm. than those 15 years that he had in there. And that idea that they say a few times, a rock and a grain of sand in water, they both sink the same. Hmm. Do you like that one? I do. Because I assume what he's talking about is you have committed a crime. Mm -hmm. You have sinned. And it doesn't matter how much. It doesn't right. matter if it's a boulder or a grain of sand. Yeah. You did this. You started the events that led to my sister's death. So you will be punished for that. Right. Which is uh, pretty rough. That is not a great way to look at life. <laughs> but you could argue that most countries' justice systems work in a similar way. Sure. Yeah. Because our justice system... In Canada, sure, better than the American ones, but it is about punishment, not mm-hmm. about rehabilitation. Right. If it were about rehabilitation, it would be like a lot of those Scandinavian ones where you're essentially going to school when you get locked up. Yeah. And you're working to be a member of society again. Right. And I would argue, like, what is the point of prison or any sort of punishment system? It would be to make you not do those crimes again. Yeah. But that's not how most people look at it. No. They want it to be punishment. Yes. When most of those types of systems just create uh, career criminals, yeah, right? If you're offenders. just being punished, you're like, okay, this is the world. I better be on that same level. Uh-huh. And that's what uh, Desu takes away from it too. Like, right. this is how things work. So I'm going to go around and bash people with a hammer because that's how this world works. Mm-hmm. And that is how the world of that movie works. And then when you start thinking about it, you go like, oh, Is that how our world works too? Mm. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. Whoa. Whoa, man. (laughs) It's a good movie. It is a good movie. (laughs) Seven out of 10 now? Are you bumping up a little? 6.5. And then I guess wrapped up in those ideas of revenge, there's all of the ideas of identity and Mm self-discovery. Because he is revenge. That is who he is through most of this movie. And same with uh, Lee. Mm -hmm. they don't have many characteristics that are outside of this vengeance. Yeah, you become totally consumed in this whole plot, I guess. And this links up with some of those visual motifs, specifically the one about mirrors. Did you see a lot of mirrors in this movie? I don't think so. There's like one in the prison. Right. Right. Which he then breaks and tries to kill himself with. Right. Uh, When he has that big confrontation with Lee, it's in front of the mirror. When he is discovered as a child watching them, uh, Lee's sister is using that mirror to watch herself. And then she sees Desu out there and sees him as well. So that's like the beginning of the whole mirror and the two, two versions of yourself. And towards the end, we talk about there being two versions of yourself Mm -hmm. and in the final hypnosis scene, he is supposed to go to the window, see the reflection of himself, and one is the monster, and one is your true self, and you're going to walk away. So if the idea of having a fractured self-identity, of having two selves wasn't enough, they just say it outright at the end. And in the end, 
the monster is going to die. Mm-hmm. You're and walking he away will be from his that person. true self. And maybe we should leave that one there and come back to it at the end. Sure. Because, yeah, there's a lot to say about that ending. And then there's also cameras, and they're kind of the opposite of, of the mirrors. Because I think Lee has like a bunch of antique cameras mm-hmm. in his very fancy penthouse. Yeah. And also when his sister dies, he's wearing a camera. Oh, yeah. And there is that piece of evidence where he is discovered to have been at the dam because there's the photo on his wall with the date. Mm -hmm. And right before she kills herself, she essentially takes a selfie. Right. So the the camera maybe is the glimpse into other people. Mm -hmm. Perhaps not always a true document, although it's literally a true document, but the beholder, Mm -hmm. uh, Lee, in this case, who has those photos up, he is able to imbue those with the meaning while with the mirrors, it's all about the reflection of yourself. Cameras and then maybe even the audio recordings are about what we see in other people. Because it is not their true self, but it is some sort of representation that the beholder can then look at and make an opinion of. And in Lee's case, he has these pictures of his sister and she is forever perfect mm-hmm. in those pictures. And this allows him to take off any personal responsibility he may have had in in her death because he was literally the person holding her before she died right but he does not take any personal responsibility in her death yeah that was one thing that i found interesting was during that scene of how he's like pulling her back from the edge and she takes the picture he doesn't ever really acknowledge other than that one scene that he was there He could have pulled her up. Yeah. He could have. That he had some, like, hand in it. But maybe that's how he is justifying it to himself over all of these years. It's someone else's fault. Mm -hmm. It's not his fault. It's not his fault for letting go. It's not his fault for having that relationship. It's not his fault for uh, having some sort of communication with his sister and getting over this. Mm -hmm. It is Desu's fault because he told one person. Yeah. It's misplaced blame to alleviate his own guilty conscience. Mm -hmm. And then if the mirror thing isn't enough, oftentimes when Desu looks at a mirror, it is cracked or broken or distorted because he has this distorted self image. I like that they used mirrors in that way. We've talked about so many movies that (laughs) use mirrors. It's It's an easy one, but it's an effective one. Yeah. But one you don't get to see in a lot of movies is teeth. I think teeth are a big motif throughout this. There are so many shots, extreme close-ups of teeth. First of all, uh, when Desu is doing that kind of grotesque smile when he's by himself, and he has that picture, which I'm not sure if he has drawn or someone has put there, of of, uh, like a face that has a a gross smile as well. And that's the one that says, um, laugh and the whole world laughs with you, cry and you weep alone. So there's the teeth there. And then, of course, we start seeing them when they're getting pulled out of people. And there's just a bunch of times of weird smiles. So I guess this can come into being a metaphor for the violence or predatory predatory nature of a lot of these characters. And the characters are made to be animalistic. And teeth, perhaps, are our most animalistic feature right Mm -hmm. if you're showing eyes that's eyes are the window to the soul but (laughs) teeth teeth are are there to to eat and he's when he gets out he says i want to eat something alive he wants to feel alive because he has been dead for for so long oh and i i guess that's one of the other big famous scenes from this movie What'd you think of the uh, the big octopus scene uh that uh, was another scene where i kind of had to turn away I think they're kind of gross just to begin with. Uh And I don't like my food to look like the animal that it was. That's true. And like even just eating calamari at a restaurant, I could only eat the round ones. Yeah. (laughs) I can't eat the little squid ones. The tentacles. The little tentacle guys. Uh, But yeah, I did not enjoy that scene at all. And I think it was kind of unnecessary. But did it give you a animalistic revulsion yes then i think it was necessary (laughs) because i think that's what they're going for okay did you know that i've eaten that you've eaten a live octopus yeah ew there's video of it 
Oh. You know what? I'll put a link. I'll put a link in the show notes. <laughs> Sanakji, it's called. And uh, when the first year I lived in Korea, I was leaving the city I was living in. And I was thinking like, oh, well, I have to try like all of the Korean things that I haven't tried. Right. I wasn't going to go to one of the dog restaurants. But I was like, you know what? I should try the live octopus. I would not eat it the way he did. The right. full octopus. <laughs> but when she yeah. said like, oh, I'll I'll cut it for you fresh. That is a, not an atypical thing to eat. That's not a rare thing. Oh, okay. It's called sanakchi, and it's not bad. Um, they slice off the tentacles. My friend I was with, uh, she said, like, oh, I like the head. And I was like, ooh, the head is all yours. <laughs> so she had the head, and I had some of the legs. But they do, they are still moving. Yeah. And you uh, put a little sesame oil and a little salt on there, and you just eat them. And you have to really chew or else they'll like, you'll choke because they'll try to crawl back up. So when he's eating the full octopus, apparently they did this in a few takes. And the actor is a Buddhist and would do a little prayer for the octopus for each take and then would just chow down oh on it. Oh my God. And the whole octopus, that would be very difficult because you have to really chew or else you could, you can die. Right. Because the, that suction is very strong and it'll crawl in oh, your I throat. Oh, I didn't even think about the suction. Yeah. Oh. Because even the little tentacles I was eating, they, they latch onto you. Oh, that's gross. Yeah. I am very uncomfortable talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you've never seen that video. No. I put it on YouTube. I think you've talked about it. But you had no interest in seeing it. But that. I don't think I ever want to see. It doesn't look like it does in this. Okay. But it's still, it's still gross. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Oh, yeah. Teeth. That's what we were talking about. Right. And then it comes up again. You know what? We'll save it because it comes up at the very end in the very last smile. Mm-hmm. Uh, another theme that's in there a lot is the hammer. Right. Hammer time. Yeah, the hammer was like a very violent way to kill people. Yeah, and it's also kind of the most simple. Yeah. Right? It's still feels visceral, but it's not your own hands. Yeah. But it's so different from a gun where there's some sort of detachment. Right? Yeah. If you are swinging that hammer, you are feeling what it hits through yeah. your hand. And I think that's a, a good weapon for, for Desu and how he's set up in this movie because he is kind of the opposite from Lee, who is essentially has superpowers in this movie. Lee can do anything, but his superpower is just wealth. Right. He's so rich that he can have people locked up magically. He can have ideas put in their head. He has all of the traits that we often see in a supervillain in like a Marvel type movie. Right. He can do everything. But the only way he does this is just that he's rich. Yeah. He can just pay people to do what he wants. Which again, I think comes into very intentional commentary in this movie. Because I think this movie isn't just look at these people and how vengeance changes their lives. Yeah. This is a reflection of us, of our society. Of course, mm -hmm. it is a different version of it. But I think everything that Park is putting into this movie, the director of Park Chan-wook, uh, everything that he is putting into this movie, he's trying, or at least putting it in our minds to link back to our world, mm -hmm. like the, the justice system and this. How different is it from ours? And Korea itself is a very capitalist society, like, like much of the world is mm -hmm. right now. And here you have the guy who has, is a supervillain only because he has the money to be so. And this working class guy who is, I guess, the hero of the movie, if you want to put a hero into a movie like this, yeah. he is a, a literal working class hero. And his weapon is the weapon of the proletariat, right? The mm -hmm. hammer. He doesn't have a sickle with him, but no. <laughs> I think it is intentional, not just in that this is a visceral and brutal weapon, but that it is a symbol of the working class. And this is his instrument of retribution and perhaps the instrument of uh, the working class rising against the mm. bourgeoisie. I didn't think about that, but you're right. Like, who doesn't own a hammer? Yeah. Even if you're, like, so poor, probably have some sort of hammer implement yeah. around. It's like, it's, like, one of the simplest tools. Yeah. And probably one of the original tools. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. You're very smart. Am I? <laughs> yeah. Every time you have like your all your insights about movies and stuff, it makes me realize just how like one dimensional 
my movie watching tends to be. Well, I don't know if that is the case, that it's one-dimensional. I think it is different from mine, but you know how I see working-class symbolism in, in too many things, yeah. right? Because that's where my mind goes. You're still having all of those visceral reactions that this movie wants you to have, mm -hmm. but it's just through conversation like this that they, that they come out. Right. Right? The movies don't want you to see all of the working pieces. They want you to feel them and not know that you have seen those things. Okay. You're getting it at the end. Yeah. You're, you're experiencing, I think, what the director wants at the end. Of, of course, that's debatable what a director wants, right? <laughs> right. But I think you are going through those motions. It's just that when we do the podcast, then we go about the process of how did we get there? Right. And I think I'm more experienced, perhaps, in uh, talking about how we got there. The analysis. Yeah. yeah. We should, I should start a podcast about that. Oh, weird. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it would be a hit. <laughs> no, I think just a couple of people a week would want to listen to it. <laughs> tell your friends, everyone. Nobody yeah. listens to our podcast. Yeah. Tell a friend to listen to their favorite movie. Yeah, watch one guy overanalyze it and the other person just enjoy. I just sit back and relax. And learn. And enjoy the movies. Yeah. That's why we work well. Exactly. <laughs> what about labyrinths and mazes? Yeah. Did you see any visual representations of maze-like things in this movie? Well, I think the prison at the beginning, for sure. Like, I think that that was a maze and um, kind of like labyrinthish in that uh, his prison cell was literally surrounded by empty rooms. and they, Were they empty? Well, I guess what I'm saying is like when he breaks through the wall, he realizes that it's not actually outdoors. Oh, I thought it is outdoors. He reaches and gets the rain. No, because he has to go through like a second wall. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's like a false ending to that little journey. And that he realizes that there's just another wall beyond it and that it's a trick. And so many, uh, there's a lot of wallpaper in this movie. Yeah. And the wallpaper always has like a labyrinthian kind of pattern mm -hmm. or it looks like something that is broken. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the patterns on people's clothing as well. It seems way more pattern than you would expect in the real world. Yeah. So there's, I think these images of uh, mazes and shattered whole things throughout and i guess the maze is, is pretty clear that he has to uh, go through this maze to figure out why he was imprisoned in the mm -hmm. first place what his wrongdoing was and then those shattered elements are maybe back to that whole shattered mirror and the shattered image of oneself because he has been lost in in this maze huh yeah you, you could maybe probably make an argument that the octopus is important because an octopus is like the tentacles is and he's wrapped up in the tentacles yeah. of this other world. But I think that might be too much of a stretch. I, I also thought that the final scene um, in Lee's apartment is like very maze like because there's like places you literally cannot walk because of the water. Parts are moving as well. Yeah. Right? So I think that that kind of also seemed a little bit maze like because there is like a forced path. And then um, he kind of gets thrown off the path and is forced to figure it out himself. Was Odesu a good guy? I don't know. Like, I don't think he was a bad guy. He wasn't bad. He wasn't this bad. No. But when he is going over and thinking about the people he has wronged, he has many names. Mm -hmm. But is that just because he's been thinking about it for 15 years and you think of like, oh, I cut off this guy in traffic once. Maybe it's from that. Yeah. Or has he actually wronged this many people? We see him like he's a kind of a dick at the beginning when he's yeah. all drunk and, and yelling and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I don't think that he is like evil. No. But he's also not depicted as being good and innocent. Right. He's just a guy. Yeah. And I think that's important. I think in the American one, they made a, a more concerted effort to make him look like a bad guy. And I think that takes away something from it. I yeah. think it's better when he's not a bad guy and he's being punished it's in this It's kind of way. ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah. And then Lee, he's a bad guy. Yes. But we don't have any insight to him outside of this one part of his life. Yeah. In the vengeance about his sister. Yeah. I guess everyone's just kind of 
morally ambiguous. And that's kind of one of those film noir, anti-hero type tropes coming through. It kind of leaves you to decide on your own. Yeah. And that's sometimes hard. Or maybe it makes you think about people who are victims of circumstance and maybe aren't terrible people and then they're still in prison because of like well we say if you do this you go to jail for this Mm -hmm. much time and it's not about whether you are repentant or if you'll do it again it's just here you go this is what happens right (laughs) i think it's his circumstance that makes him kind of a bad guy odesu no uh lee or I get, or was that the thing that broke him? Because I was going to say, well, he's clearly criminally insane. I think, but it's maybe what the, happened. the death of his sister is what broke him, and that has been the one thing he has latched onto, and yeah. everything in his vi- life revolves around that. I think that's kind of what happened. It seems like, and it. I think that in a you know grief counseling is readily available kind of world maybe he wouldn't have spiraled off into this one Mm. moment of his life and that makes all of his decisions for him like i don't think he was like born evil can someone be born evil i don't know is that a different podcast that's a different podcast (laughs) we'll get there we'll talk about head injuries and (laughs) (laughs) maybe we'll we'll um uh, watch clockwork orange sometime (laughs) and then we can get into all of that And I think the visuals kind of go with this moral ambiguity sometimes because there's times where we have these scenes that look like quite beautiful and they could be from a music video, but then you have this brutal violence going in it. And there's that kind of juxtaposition of, is this beautiful? Should I be watching this fight scene and being like, oh, cool. Mm -hmm. But then how the fight scenes are conducted, they're not smooth and fluid. They're, They're brutal and they're clumsy at times and then that makes you question like oh yeah maybe it's not all good and everything in this movie is kind of the same way like you should question is he good is he bad i'm not sure i shouldn't just go by how things are presented just because desu is presented as this guy who has crazy hair he he just needs some conditioner oh he desperately and a like a brush. oh and he gets it later remember he actually goes to the the hair salon yeah so that was cool um <laughs> Is he a crazy person or is he someone who's been pushed to this level? And then we have uh, Lee who looks polished and has this Mm -hmm. great home and uh, is a very handsome guy, but he is the kind of the true evil of it. So it's making you question your assumptions both in the style of filmmaking and in the representations of these characters. Yeah, I thought um, the way that Lee was presented was very much of that like shiny, beautiful um evil villain kind of trope that they yeah. use he looks like he could be a, a john wick guy yeah because he's like super made up and he looks perfect and also is evil <laughs> and quietly evil yeah i loved when odesu is doing that bit of like do you want me to be your dog i'll be your dog yeah. and he's licking his feet and everything and lee's reaction he has a handkerchief and he's just stifling laughter. Yeah. That was infuriating. There's also a moment where I didn't know if he was like crying or laughing. Yes, that's what I thought as well. I'm and like, then when did you see this him, break him, yeah. his apology? Or is he just so far gone that he can't feel anything else? Yeah. And it's not a big triumphant evil villain laugh. He's just like, <laughs> yeah, just laughing at him. Yeah. Look at you now, kind of. Yeah. And maybe it's a little triumph that he got him to this point. Because I think this is what he wanted. Yeah, he wanted him to be so far gone. He wanted him to realize, in in Lee's mind, realize the crime that he had done Mm -hmm. and the effect it had had and feel the same thing. Right. He didn't just want him to be sorry for it. He wanted him to truly understand how Lee felt. Mm -hmm. And he somehow through this crazy web orchestrates that so yeah. now desu fully understands yeah. what lee feels um in his own mind of course it's his mind is kind of crazy yeah right? <laughs> but uh, in lee's mind this is this is the perfect punishment because yeah. he fully understands and is completely apologetic for it yeah did you think that he killed himself so that he could be with his sister Oh, I never really thought about like, it. Like I feel way. like he accomplished his goal. Yeah. And was like, I can now be at rest with her. I think so. I think it is a 
first that he is a prisoner of his Mm -hmm. vengeance. I guess that's the theme throughout is prisons and vengeance and truth. And Mm -hmm. you can be a prisoner to your revenge and to what you consider the truth and finding out that truth. Lee was a prisoner to his vengeance and truth. And now that he has gotten his revenge because Odesu is completely broken, Mm -hmm. has uh, committed the same kind of sin that he did in the, the incestual stuff... And also, he has gotten Desu so warped from those 15 years through this whole uh, journey to find what Lee's version of the truth is. He now has Desu agreeing to his version of the truth Mm -hmm. in that you said this one thing and that killed my sister. Right. Desu is now agreeing to that, which is a is a crazy way, but through yeah. all of this manipulation, he's gotten him there. So now I think Lee's truth is the truth. Right. In that room, at least, between all the people there, because that other guy's dead. <laughs> yes. So his truth has won. Now he is no longer a prisoner to that truth and can he has nothing more to live for because that's that was his prison and now he is free from it. Huh. That's kind of what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, anything else that you liked or wanted to talk about before we get into the very ending? I think that might be it for me. I feel like, yeah, I feel like we've touched on a lot of things that I kind of thought about. And you've also brought some other things that I did not think about. (laughs) I was worried about this podcast because usually I take a few days to think about the movie and we just watched it. But as we talk about it, I feel like it's all getting put together. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that I was a little worried about this one, too, because right after watching it, I felt like I didn't really know what I just watched. Kind of like when you watch Cyborg. Yeah. You were like, what was that? (laughs) This one was a little bit easier to kind of figure out, especially just the like reading a little bit more about it. It kind of made more sense to me. Right. And also, you know, catching the twist finally. Yeah, that's that's a big one to to miss. I can't remember what other movie it was when there was a big reveal at the end and that was like kind of the linchpin of the whole movie and you realized it when we did the podcast. After. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember what movie that was? I don't, but I do remember you being like, "What?" <laughs> Wait, Bruce Dill Willis was a ghost? I was <laughs> So let's talk about the ending then, because I think it is pretty brilliant in a few ways, because it brings together all of these motifs and themes we had seen. Do you want to give me your reading first, and then I can overanalyze things like I love to do? Of like the entire ending? The Maybe we should go back a step and talk about the reveal ending, like when it goes into the past and you get to see that kind of Escher-like sequence of going up the stairs and it's his past self and his present self yeah. and all of the, those people. I really enjoyed that. Did you like that or was it just confusing? It was kind of confusing um, because, I don't know, I guess I feel like in movies that do something like that, usually you see it once kind of normal and then when they're bringing in this like kind of psychological element, you see it in the way that they kind of showed it. So it felt a little bit confusing. And I think that's kind of intentional, too. I think being confused in this movie is doesn't mean that you didn't get it. I think that's what they're going for. It's another one of those labyrinths. And here, Desu is so lost in the labyrinth of his past that he is literally lost in this Mm -hmm. labyrinth of his past. And we have... It's like an M.C. Escher painting of all these stairs everywhere and the, the two timelines going together. I think it worked very well. If you realize Mm -hmm. what's going on i guess it's a good manifestation of his kind of spiraling and being lost in all of these ideas yeah i found the kind of perspective shifts of like the quarry that they were at and from one view it seemed really really big and from another it didn't quite seem as big um i found that was kind of a good way to show that I don't know, like, you know how when you're a child, everything seems bigger? It's the subjectivity of the memory. Yeah, Yeah. so it felt like a little bit of reality as well as, like, that childlike view of how your school seemed huge. And then you go back and you see it, and it's just, like, kind of small. 
Yeah. 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 So I enjoyed that. I think that that kind of really kind of tied together the past and what was happening in the present. And I, I liked that. And I usually hate in a movie when there is such a convoluted plot as this, when the villain explains everything. Mm -hmm. And here they have that, but I think it's done in the best way possible because it is still somewhat disorienting because that's what Desu is going through. It is disorienting to him. And we're not sure if these are credible narrators either of them. Yeah. And I, I think it shows you that this is all in Lee's head. Like, this is all his memory. Nobody else has this memory that he's based this whole life on. But I think in having those pictures from it, it is the director showing you this did happen in Mm -hmm. the real world. Of course, he has taken it to mean all of these other things, but these events still happen. So it still gives you some sort of objectivity with that. Yeah. And I think that's a, a clever thing to do. Yeah, I like that. So the very ending, I guess. Very, very ending, yes. Is uh, the... When they're in the mountains and there's the the hypnosis. hypnotist and everything. Yeah, I think we said earlier, I think I could have done without the hypnosis. And I thought it was really interesting that he was being hypnotized to forget that she's his daughter. And I I thought it was really interesting um, that that's kind of the approach that they took for the ending because... I don't know, maybe he's feeling like his life is already just so screwed up. He would just like to be happy in kind of an innocent, unknowing way. So what do you think is going to happen after this? I don't know. I'd like to think that they're just going to live a quiet life together and try and like heal from the trauma of even if you like like unconscious trauma. Kind of blissfully unaware of who they really are to each other? Yeah. Oh. I think... I think that's kind of where I thought it would go. So it works. The hypnosis works. I think so. See, this is where I disagree. Okay. So first, before we get into that, I think this is great because it brings together all of those ideas like I was talking about. First in uh, the teeth, Mm -hmm. because we get to see this big smile at the end. But then it breaks. Yeah. Right? It starts turning into a frown and it looks like he starts to cry. Mm Mm-hmm. It's that motif, but it's giving you insight into what I think is the true ending. And also, there's the idea of the laugh and the whole world laughs with you, cry and you weep alone. I think this is what he's doing at the end. He's laughing. He's smiling because he's with, with Mido. But he then starts weeping because it didn't work. That hypnosis did not work. Uh... And his weeping will be alone. Because he's not going to tell her the truth. So he's laughing to laugh with the rest of the world. Right. But in reality, he will cry alone. Whoa, man. And then it also brings into that idea the um, fragmentation of self and that mirror part. Because mm-hmm. in the hypnosis, he is instructed to go and see his reflection. But the monster who knows the truth will turn away and walk and die. And we see him in his mind at the penthouse looking at this fragmented version, this distorted version of himself. Mm -hmm. But the version that looks sympathetic and understanding is the version in the mirror or in the window. And she says the monster will walk away. When we show the real world, we see those footsteps. Mm -hmm. So the true, like literal Desu has walked. Mm. The monster was supposed to be the one that walks. Oh, the monster so who knows the truth. With so this... when he wakes up, he has done the walk. I think that is the monster self that mm. knows the truth. That's left over. The yeah. wrong part walked away. Yes. Hmm. Interesting. I guess it is like it's a very ambiguous ending. I feel like we've said ambiguous a lot this episode. Yeah. But it is a very ambiguous ending and I think you kind of have to figure out how you think it ended. Yeah. Yeah. I think it could go either way, but the way his smile breaks, and because I was kind of linked onto these ideas of the reflection of the teeth mm-hmm. and the laugh and the whole world laughs with you, mm-hmm. cry and you weep alone. Those three things, if you're thinking of those ideas, and I think they are there throughout the movie, they definitely lead me to believe he knows the truth. Right. But he has decided to go along with this life for her sake, perhaps, Mm -hmm. 
for his own sake in some way, but he knows he will always be weeping alone in the end. Wow. Whoa, oh, man. And whatever you think happened, you're still uncomfortable mm-hmm. because they're they're together regardless. Yeah. And you can just think of like, oh, we don't, they don't know that they are related, but they're going to live together as a couple and that's gross. And you can be uncomfortable in that way. Mm-hmm. But I think it goes one step further in that he knows and will continue anyways. Mm-hmm. And then he will never be free of of Lee's revenge. This right. will always be with him. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Wow. Still just a 6.5? Yeah. Huh. I think it's pretty good. It's a good movie. Okay, I'll give it a seven. All right, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that might be a good uh, way to wrap up. Old boy, Sounds any good. final thoughts? I think it's a movie worth watching. That's something we can both agree yeah, on. I, I think I, I think this is one that definitely benefits from us like talking it out and doing the book report on it. Yeah. But I, uh, I think... You should give it a try. Yeah, and honestly, if you've listened to this and haven't watched it yet, ooh, it's kind of all been ruined for you. But go watch it again, go maybe. Watch it. <laughs> if you saw it long ago, it's time for a rewatch, perhaps. Mm, yeah, you may have forgotten. Yeah, I did. Yeah, exactly. And Indy remembers everything. Apparently, <laughs> except for old boy. Except for old boy. But now I will. Yeah. Well. All right. Well, I think that might be it for us this week. You can join us again next week where we will have two spoiler-free things of the week. And Sam will let us know what we're watching for the following week's big watch. We don't know the theme yet, but we'll have some sort of theme that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Or do you know the theme? I don't know the theme yet. Maybe it'll be movies. The theme is movies. (laughs) That's just the theme of the podcast. Right. Usually. (laughs) Usually. Okay, we'll see you next week, everyone. Bye. Goodbye.